and inspiring from the Prime Minister of New Zealand and the Crown Prince of Norway. Uh, now we're really getting down to basics because we're actually going to discuss uh, uh, financing, uh, solutions for financing the Sustainable Development Goals. I, I just want to give you a little bit of motivation uh, why for I this is important. I think when Jeff first went to the General Secretary, Antonio Guterres, and he was just getting his vision about how we are going to get the SDGs implemented, you would have expected him to turn around. Please, people, can you sit down and take your seats? Thank you. Thank you. You would have expected, you would have expected him to say, well, we've got to go out and win the hearts and minds of people. Now, I'm, in the, I'm an economist by training, so I shouldn't, have, um, I shouldn't have been surprised with what he actually said. And he actually said two things. One is that we have to take the focus away from security and to put it on sustainable development. We have to take the money that's flowing into security and put that same energy and money into sustainable development because that is the thing that will prevent, will guarantee peace and prevent future wars. The second thing he emphasized, if we want to win this battle and get the SDGs implemented, what we've got to do is reorientate finance. The equity markets, the philanthropy, tax funds, uh, all, the, all the different financial products that are out there, we have to reorientate them towards funding research and technology, towards all the activities that give us and will bring us the sustainable development goals. So that's why in terms of one key means of implementation of this project, and we have to remember that the SDGs are not the sustainable development agenda. The same development agenda has a vision, but it also has a set of means of implementation and one, the two big ones are obviously finance and data and partnerships and education and other things. Um, so in this panel, we're actually going to discuss a very key means of implementation, and that's this challenge to reorientate the finance towards sustainable development. Okay, I'm very pleased that I have uh, th three leaders uh, that are going to do this for us, and I'm just going to bring them out one at a time, and I really would like you to give a round of applause to our, what's going to be our first panelist, and she's called Jessa Esprey, and she's a senior advisor of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, so please give her a round of applause. <laughs> so Jessica, I, just, just to start off, um, it'd be great just to give us, to tell us who you are and what you do. I should start by saying I'm terrified at the idea of coming after Prime Minister Arden. Um, we're both quite young, we both have young children, and I think that's where the similarities end, because when she said that she was 17 and enrolled in politics, I thought back to when I was 17, and I think the only thing I was doing was enrolling in a pub. So um, it's a bit of an intimidating act to follow. Um, so I'm a senior advisor to the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and I'm director of the data program, which is called SDSN Trends. Um, yeah, and very delighted to be here today. Excellent. Um, and one thing is, uh, I know your past and history, but um, would you like to tell the audience anything in your history or past that's either personal or related to the SDGs, so that get, they get to know you a little bit better? Sure. Yeah. Um, so prior to coming to work for Professor Sachs and being at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, I um, had the great privilege of spending three years working in Liberia. Uh, which, as I'm sure you all know, is a country in West Africa. It's the, one of the third poorest countries in the world. But prior to having their new president, who was a former footballer, they had the first female president on the continent called Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who's an absolutely inspiring woman, um, talking about female leaders. Um, and I had the, the joy of being her special advisor on the Sustainable Development Goal Negotiations. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. So then I want to invite out our next panelist, uh, who is Sherry Lusalem, the Vice Chairman of Gitti Group. Uh, please, a round of applause for her. So Sherry, the same questions. Um, oh. Would you like to tell them? who you are and yes. what you do? Uh, I'm uh, Shari Nusalim uh, from GT Group. It's a business group and uh, we have development, um, uh, real estate, uh, manufacturing. It's a diversified business group. Uh, I'm also involved with uh, SDSN it's, uh, on the leadership council and also the chair for SDSN Southeast Asia. Okay, Thank excellent. You. And the same question about something in your past or history that um, drove you towards this past? Uh, I think uh, 
Uh, from the business front, I have seen sort of from the family, there's always been very, uh, a lot of interest in longer term solution. Uh, and, uh, but we have seen challenges uh, also in our business development. We develop uh, like the largest aquaculture business uh, in the world uh, in terms of uh, shrimp farming at one time. And, uh, but we actually lost that in a financial crisis, 97, 98. So we know that it is very challenging and there's also issues, um, uh, the other aspects. It's very important to have a holistic approach to development and peace is absolutely um, also one of the areas uh, that is needed for, for that. Oh, Thank you. Thanks. And finally, but not least, uh, we have Remy Roo, for a chairman of the International Development Finance Network. Please, a round of applause. For <laughs> so Remy, Same questions, so to introduce what um, you... Professionally, so yeah. good, good morning everybody. Very pleased and honored to, to be here. Um, well, I, I'm an old civil servant, I fear. So I worked for the French Treasury for a long time, for uh, Interior Ministry, as well as for the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I'm uh, heading the French Development Agency, AFD, for two years now. So I switched to development banker. And anything you'd like to tell them about your past, oh. your career that brought um, you to where you are? May maybe the fact that I, I come from a very, very remote part of France, mm -hmm. uh, in a center called uh, Corrèze, a land of uh, forests, a land of uh, migrants as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. uh, and a territory that was uh, specialized for a long time for for breeding cattle, for, and in my mind, even the territory that was somehow colonized in, a, in, in the way we, we organized our economy uh, centuries ago. And just to give you that, it, 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 it gave me a huge sense of unfairness and an obsession to draw comparisons, linkages, uh, well, with other settings where these issues are uh, running, ongoing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, I will give the, the panelists a little bit of time to, uh, they've prepared, uh, I'm sure, about 10 minutes each or less, um, but I really do want a conversation. And something that hasn't been happening, really, is that people have not been putting forward questions on Twitter. So I, so I know you all have something to say about finance for development, and you want to get your, your questions in. So please, uh, I'll be watching hashtag ICSD2018. Uh, um, so put the questions on and get them, and even before the panel is finished, if there's something you've always wanted to know about finance and finance development, even the current financial system and what, sort of, what it does or doesn't do, uh, get the questions up to me, and then we can have a lively conversation after the, the brief presentations uh, that we're going to have. So I think first, though, I'll stick, if it's all right, Jessica, that we'll, uh, we'll have you first, and then we'll, we'll go across the panelists, and I'll be watching the questions when they come in. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, and as I said before, it's, it's a real honor to be here. So um, I thought I might start by sort of setting the scene a bit. Uh, so we're talking about financing the SDGs. So just to go back to basics, um, what is the kind of, what's the cost of implementing the Sustainable Development Goals? Well, a couple of years ago, uh, a brilliant colleague of mine, who's the executive director of SDSN, um, Guido, he came up with an estimate for how much it was going to cost. And he estimated it was going to be about $1.4 trillion a year to achieve the SDGs. Now, that's a huge amount of money uh, and seems very intimidating. But actually, when you break it down and look at the, the resource gap, it's a lot more manageable. And Jeff Sachs this year, along with the IMF, have both done uh, costings of, of how much it's you know, going to cost and also the gap in order to achieve the SDGs. And happily enough, for both Jeff and the IMF, they came up with the same figure, which makes life a bit easier. Um, they both more or less agreed that it was going to be between 300 and 350 billion um, uh, additional uh, that was going to be required in order to fund the SDGs. And that's, that's the scale of the funding gap. Um, so the big question is, how do we fill this, right? How do we, how do we sort of uh, bridge this? So current ODA at the moment is on app ODA, sorry, um, Special Development Assistance, is a, about 3%, um, sitting at about 0.3% of, of that country's GDP. Um, 
if all DAC countries did as Jeff asked Prime Minister Arden earlier today, if they all met their 0.7% commitments, uh, we could probably uh, get another 228 billion in the financial system. So it would go a long way to filling the gap uh, for monitoring the SDGs. But there's still well over 100 billion there that's unmet. And we have to bear in mind that we're sitting in a current political climate where getting those governments to fill that gap is a huge uphill battle. So the long and the short of all this is that you know, other forms of investment are going to be absolutely fundamental. Um, so how do we make the case? How do we encourage these private actors particularly to invest in sustainable development? Well, I'm going to take the example from a, one small piece of this puzzle. Um, I work a lot on data systems for sustainable development um, with the group called Trends. And so I think I'm just going to zoom in on, on that, one, that one piece. So at the moment, um, there is a, a big shortfall as well in data systems for sustainable development, in the fundamental building blocks of how we monitor and track progress on sustainable development, how we count populations, how we monitor environmental change. Um, and one estimate has said that it's you know, to expand surveys and censuses and, and get more satellite imagery and so on in order to monitor the SDGs, we'd need about 17 billion. Um, however, again, if you look at what we have versus what we need, actually the shortfall is quite a lot smaller. It's actually about, based on a study I did, um, it's about 600 million per annum that is required in order to, to meet that gap. So that's actually not a lot. I mean, in the great scheme of things, um, that's a tiny percentage of the total order of magnitude that's required. And you would think, data, right? Understanding what's happening, where, where the poorest are, where the most vulnerable are, would be something that everyone would say, that's pretty fundamental. If I'm only going to invest a bit of money, I'm going to put it in that. But sadly, since 2014, we have seen no increase in investments in data and statistics for sustainable development. In fact, it's completely flatlining which is pretty heartbreaking for people like me who are data nerds. So in my group, STSN Trends, and in partnership with a group called the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, we did a study looking at the return on investments from these kind of systems. And we did that because we think it's, it's not really enough to just call on altruism, right? You can't just say, this is the right thing to do. We need to know where the poorest people are. We also need to make the kind of instrumental case. You know, why is this a good use of your finite resources? And so we did a series of case studies, which we're launching today um, at sdsntrends.org, looking at different types of data systems and the return on investment. And so one that I'm going to talk about is um, one of these cases was on Landsat. Now, there's probably lots of you very clever physicists and geologists and satellite people in the room who know exactly what Landsat is. But for those of you that don't, um, it's a satellite program. It's been running since the 1970s in the United States, uh, funded by NASA and the US government. Uh, to date, they've launched eight satellites, um, and those satellites orbit the Earth, taking a full orbital photograph of the Earth uh, 14 times a day. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, it's at 30 meter resolution, which means it's not small enough to kind of let us see individuals and houses, but it's uh, a, a good level to be able to see environmental change, urban change, um, waterway, uh, pollution, a whole range of environmental, economic, and social impacts. And it's absolutely fundamental. Landsat is now free, and almost every country in the world uses it um, to huge effect. We use it to look at, as I said, how our cities are growing, um, how our crops and agricultural fields are developing, where we have flood risk, and so on. So a study was done to look at the return of that investment. To fund one Landsat mission costs about 650 million, which is probably over about seven years. But a major study done looking at how those da the data was being used in loads of different ways showed that the return on investment from that system is about 2.19 billion per year for national and international users. So I think if there was ever a compelling case to invest in a data system, that's a, that's a pretty good one. Um, so I think the key takeaways I just wanted to make are, you know, the cost of achieving the SDGs is high. Um, but the funding gap is actually comparatively small in the, the vast scheme of things. The international community is going to have a huge role to play, and ideally, we should meet the 0.7% commitment, but that's not going to go far enough. So we have to really try and speak to private investors and, and diversify this conversation. And then finally, 
Um, we need all development actors to make the case. You know, we can't just rely on altruism. We need to actually show why this is a really judicious use of, of resources, particularly you know, when economic times are hard and so on, and you have to make hard decisions nationally, and really show how you know, small investments in basic things like data systems can actually generate huge improvements that can enable us to see development, changes in sustainable development over time. Thanks. Okay, excellent. So we are getting a few questions on Twitter, but, um, and they're good ones, and I'm going to hold them. Um, so what I encourage you to do is get those big questions in, which will, which will inform our conversation after, this, after we have uh, interjections by the panel. But if there is a direct question after a talk, I will ask, okay? Um, so over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, I I would like to uh, share, I think earlier Jeff um, has talked about the urgency of time to scale up and uh, I think that we, we are left with very little time and so what we have offered uh, at the time, because Indonesia is hosting the world's largest finance meeting of the year, the IMF uh, World Bank Annual Meeting this October in Bali. So we, uh, I think together uh, with the Indonesian government, has offered a platform together with SDSN as a co-organizer, together with International Chambers of Commerce, the world's uh, largest business organization, um, as well as our foundation, our United in Diversity Foundation, uh, to form this forum called Trihita Karana Forum for Sustainable Development, Blended Finance and Innovation for Better Business, Better World. So this uh, Better Business, Better World is actually come from the report by the uh, Business and Sustainable Development Commission uh, uh, that is also a, a partner. And uh, I, maybe I have a video that we just show first, uh, just a short video, and then I will share a little bit more. To solve the world's problems, the United Nations and world leaders launched 17 goals called the Sustainable Development Goals to make for a better and happier world. The first 10 goals are inclusiveness, humanitarian, social, and people problems. The next five goals are about sustainability and nature. Finally, goals 16 and 17 on peace and partnership are about spiritual values. Having harmonies with people, nature, and the spiritual make the world a happy place. This is the SDG Pyramid to Happiness. So, okay. just to say though, um, a lot of countries, we heard about Norway taking on a goal like SDG 14, and there is a tendency for us to sign up for this agenda by signing up or aligning ourselves to a goal, and particularly countries. But I think it is really quite remarkable and very important that countries like Indonesia sign up to one of one elements of what's called the means of implementation of the agenda. So to be signing up for the finance component I think it's just so important, and to be driving that in Bali at that conference and bringing in the big, the big financial stakeholders, I think this is really important. Um, and I think this was that, this is the video was going to uh, <laughs> sign off at that in the end, but uh, I just think that this is the main point here, right? Um, and other countries should be driving data. Maybe they are, maybe there are countries, but you know, as countries yes. pick up the goals, other countries should be picking up the means of implementation yes. and really driving it home. Yes. Um, 
Yeah. Oh yeah, no, continue. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, I, I think you know, uh, in the later part, it will explain sort of what are the different means of blended finance, and uh, I think the government has uh, put together a national task force across uh, ministries, uh, agencies, and. Uh, they have actually had very uh, diligent meetings and for these outcomes, we are looking at 10 different outcomes to be announced in Bali. So from the oceans, women, to uh, food and land use, we are looking at in a e sort of an ecosystem, multi-sectorial, collaborative approach so that you can have a bigger scale uh, success. And uh, I think uh, from renewables and other, as well as the policy lab, and. So we have been amazed by the interests and the partnerships, you know, from, uh, of course, the uh, multilateral organizations, but also from, uh, I think, World Bank, MF, uh, OECD, uh, China Development Bank, a a Asian Development Bank, Milken, World Economic Forum, and uh, many other partners. So uh, I think um, we have, uh, an initiative that uh, also would like to look at the innovation aspects on this. And so uh, I think we would love to collaborate um, with you, Rami, and also uh, with Jessica, I think, in delivering this. You know, how do we really collaborate? And many of you in the room, um, if there are ideas or uh, how to really allow this platform to really shine so that the world will see that there is opportunities for business to really uh, come in, because I think the shortfall, really, you need the private sector. I think the rest of the video actually shows what is the missing link and how to engage the business. I see the stop sign, so. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's a, a financing gap and a risk gap, and, a, and even more importantly, governments can orientate finance to more so social issues and environmental issues, and all of this was there, so I, I think this is excellent, and we'll come back to that. So Remy, we give you your... Thank your you, Paul. Yeah. Um, to, to succeed in implementing SDGs, I think we need, uh, we need three elements. We urgently need these elements. First is um, we need a new concept, encompassing concept. Second, we need new coalitions. And um, third, we need frontier, frontier actors. Um, I believe in concept, I believe in clarity, uh, I believe in um, power behind concepts. And I was there in, at the three summits in 2015 in, in Addis, in, uh, in um, New York and in Paris. Of course, I was the, the lead negotiator on, uh, on climate finance yeah, yeah. For, for, for France. Um, and in my view, the, the sequence was somehow unfortunate. We should have, well, there are good reasons why we did that, but we should have uh, started with uh, SDGs, then take one SDG, climate, and then ask for financing for development. And so the, the financing for development track, in my view, remains somehow unfinished. Um, and so we are somehow in a contradiction now, which is we summon ODA, Jessica was talking about ODA, to finance SDGs. And, and in my mind, it's impossible. I mean, we're, we're, and we are doomed to fail by 2030 as long as we do not uh, set uh, an, a new framework, um, a new concept. So I propose to call it, I don't know, what, maybe sustainable development investment or solidarity development investment or shared development investment something that would be more uh, inclusive. Uh, we have to host, recognize, orient, especially South-South flows uh, beyond, uh, beyond ODA, uh, and something that, has to, that could mobilize, entice um, uh, the private sector. So I really see financing for development uh, with three circles. A, a, a first one, very pure, of course, that should be 100% SDGs, which is ODA. Then you have a second circle uh, with other international flows. Um, the OECD DAC is working on a TOSD uh, aggregate. That, that could be the answer. And you have a way larger circle um, with uh, domestic uh, investments and resources, of course, that we have to turn uh, in a direction of uh, of, of SDGs. And so w 
these circles, of course, we need an SDG filter to orient, as you said, uh, all financial flows um, towards the agenda. For that, uh, we need the new coalitions, new platforms. Uh, I believe in international um, action. I do not believe in uh, self-reliance. <laughs> I do not believe in uh, friends of France. Um, so, of course, we have to open our arms to all willing uh, partners. Uh, they can be unlike-minded, uh, anyway. Uh, and so I'm, um, I have the honor to uh, chair a, a very unique uh, group, which is called International Development Finance Club, IDFC, the original IDFC. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the gathering of the 23 largest national and regional development, public development banks. So you have uh, AFD with Caisse des Depots in France behind. You have KFW in Germany, you have JICA in Japan, and all the others are the very large, powerful financial institutions in the South. So you have BNDES in Brazil, you have CAF, you have DBSA in South Africa, you have Caisse des Depots et Gestion in Morocco, TDB Bank, you have the China Development Bank that was mentioned, and the total financial capacity of the group is $800 billion a year. Compare this to the 20 billion of UN agencies or the 200 billion of MDBs. Mm. And it's not a competition mm. because you, you see these institutions have the very special capacity to listen to SDGs, to international signals, and to transfer them deeply uh, in our constituencies, like no international organization can do. Of course, they are no, no non-concessional, most of them. They are mostly dealing with infrastructure. But they are waiting for a mandate, waiting to be uh, leveraged, waiting uh, to be uh, oriented. And for that, of course, uh, so, so the, the point is, when we talk about uh, blended finance, when we talk about financing for development, I'm a bit surprised right now, we, we talk about ODA, so mm. grants mostly, mm. and we talk about pure private investment. And there are a lot of countries, see the, see the UK for instance, they have DFID and now they are pushing for CDC. Mm. But, and many others are doing that. And politically I understand uh, the vision, but uh, maybe we are missing a whole segment of financial actors uh, so, not so well known in Anglo-Saxon world, but uh, right. in emerging markets, they are there, they are very powerful, and we need to, to push for that. And my third remark, of course, is uh, ODA keeps a very special role, and development agencies a very special role to spur, to push for that uh, reorientation. Um, this is what we intend to do at AFD, so maybe you know we are the we are the oldest uh, development uh, institution in the world. We were born uh, December the 2nd, 1941, founded by General de Gaulle in London as a, the, the case of uh, Free France, of uh, resistance. And, and then, of course, we switched to, to development banking after World War, World War II. We, we hope to be the youngest. <laughs> and we have a new strategy for that, uh, just the five key commitments in a, in a nutshell. We want to be an agency that is 100% Paris Agreement, okay. meaning we want to fully align all our projects and programs to support the trajectories, set long-term trajectories set by the country according to the, the Paris Agreement. Doing the same as for macroeconomics, in a way. We have trajectories for public finance and macroeconomics, and we are all choosing our instruments our projects according to what we think of these trajectories. We have to do the same on the environment. Right. And we have to choose our projects and support these trajectories. Of course, this is very immature. There is no IMF of uh, SDGs, mm -hmm. uh, no IMF of uh, climate. And so we, we are starting to develop internally within the agency methodology, uh, analysis to have a judgment on where the country stands uh, according, uh, regarding their, their uh, commitments for climate. At the same time, we want to be, we call it 100% social link, social cohesion, reconciling uh, the environmental and the social um, part of, uh, of, of the SDGs. 3D development thinking, 
of course, we have to rebalance. You mentioned it uh, between security and development, especially in the Sahel, where we are very active. And two last two commitments, uh, we say non-sovereign first. I think that's a very, very key element. Non-sovereign meaning way beyond the private sector, I would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we also have to find way, ways to, to finance local authorities, to find um, civil society, especially at a time when many, many governments are back into areas of uh, indebtedness where they have to be very selective and, and cautious. And you know our institutions are mostly going sovereign. And so probably we're back in the wall if we do not rapidly switch uh, and shift to non-sovereign financing. We have a long experience of that at uh, IFD, uh, willing to, to, to share it. Uh, and the last is, uh, well, I, I, I stop here, is, uh, we call it partnership by design, uh, meaning uh, we want to host as many uh, partners in France, in Europe, uh, and worldwide, uh, going, turning uh, southward uh, with us in a process of uh, um, a, a huge change um, impulsed by President Macron behind the French development policy. So we will do our duty, push to 0.55 of our GDP for, for ODA, but at the same time try to install a, a broader debate that is the issue of uh, financing the SDGs, which is something very different. Okay, excellent. Um, so we did download the video so we can play it. I think what happened was I told them all to get on Twitter and then I, I interfered with the download. So, but <laughs> would you like to finish it? Will we play uh, it if, again? If, uh, yeah, I, if possible. It's your it choice. Explains a bit on the, yeah, okay. on the blended finance. And it's only a few minutes. Let's yes, play it. Yeah, Let's play it. To solve the world's problems, the United Nations and world leaders launched 17 goals called the Sustainable Development Goals to make for a better and happier world. The first 10 goals are inclusiveness, humanitarian, social, and people problems. The next five goals are about sustainability and nature. Finally, goals 16 and 17 on peace and partnership are about spiritual values. Having harmonies with people, nature, and the spiritual make the world a happy place. This is the SDG Pyramid to Happiness.
announce two new initiatives relevant to one of our co-hosts today, Indonesia. ICC will be partnering with the government of Indonesia to co-host a major blended finance forum at the October 2018 annual World Bank IMF meetings in Bali. I'm just going to, I, actually I'm getting handles here so uh, they don't really reflect names, so I won't put the names on the questions. This is a really difficult question and it's one that, like I need to go back to school, I'm an economist and I can't figure this out, but it goes basically like this, right? That, you know, people in households save money and they save it because they want to invest in their kids and their education. People put money into pension funds because they need money when they're old, right? So households have this beautiful long-term thinking that is socially responsible, right? But somehow these funds end up in financial houses and we live in the world where how does that happen? Because if we kind of understand how that happens, then we might have a chance of understanding how we can reorientate finance towards the more medium, medium long-term into the more, uh, let's call it public sphere, or more responsible economic, social, and environmental spending. So, do we have the answers on this stage for that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I but I think it's a sensible question, yeah. you know. Now, of course, we're, maybe I start. We're, we're all searching for this answer. And there are, as I said, there's, there's not yet the encompassing framework and the solution. There are, there are various elements, actually, we, uh, as you know, uh, President Macron um, hosted uh, One Planet Summit yeah. uh, yesterday. Um, and we, um, there's a coalition uh, for climate finance that is emerging, uh, gathering philanthropists, um, mm. asset managers. Sure. And, and we are searching to create a fund. Larry Fink was there with BlackRock okay. uh, to invest in renewable uh, mm. in Asia, in Africa. Mm. Uh, and try to mix, of course, uh, concessional resources uh, for first losses or for investing, um, guaranteeing uh, to leverage uh, to leverage the, the funds that BlackRock is uh, uh, is managing. So that that's the big one. But there are also several initiatives. One was also uh, confirmed yesterday. It's called the LDN Fund, Land Degradation Neutrality Fund with an asset manager called Mirova, EIB, uh, AFD. So we're, we're touching water on all that. But my, sense, yeah. my sense on those, though, it's a kind of like a voluntary participation where they would get some leverage or risk written off by some parties that would come in. You know what I mean? It's not, oh, I, think, I, think, I think what we're getting at is that somehow when you're on the open market or when you have equity, like maybe Japan, that you'd actually put strict criteria Right, that this money can only be used uh, for sustainable oh, development. Sure, sure. Uh, no, you have that side of the market, yes, yeah. sir, uh, impact investing that, it, mm. that is growing. And Larry Fink shared with the other yesterday that he was feeling uh, more and more of his clients uh, were willing to invest in responsible uh, um, opportunities. Yes, uh, thank I, you. Um, I think there's a lot of hopes on that front. Um, I think just since we uh, started last year to uh, work on this blended finance, uh, yesterday I think the Indonesian government had been meeting with the pension funds, with the BlackRock and all the funds to invest so in the SDG fund mm. that is going to be announced in, um, uh, in October at okay. the forum. So uh, there has been, um, uh, I mean in the world there's around $290 trillion of financial assets. So. To, to crowd in some of that for sustainable development that is needed is, is possible and there's been uh, 100 over cases and increasing, increasingly so. So de-risk uh, 
I think with ODA, with uh, multilateral organization, the concessionary part to crowd in the private sector so that you know, the horizon could be longer term, so that it is possible to uh, solve the longer term solutions. And our own uh, project, I think we have a project in Bali, I think you see Christine uh, Lagarde, I think this is, we were on the cover of the G20 magazine. Uh, yeah. This is a project in Bali, a development real estate. But how did it get there? I think it is. Uh, I think the idea is if you can uh, really focus on it, there is uh, opportunities. Thank so you. what did you say? Two hundred and fifteen uh, tw trillion. Two hundred ninety trillion dollars of financial. Two hundred ninety trillion dollars. And how much do we need? We just need one and a half or three. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage? Uh, who's the mathematician the here? There's right? a range of studies. Uh, you know, yeah. from one point five to five to six trillion annual shortfall. Sure. So there is. Yeah. Yeah. But so that's a very small fraction. It is uh, a small fraction. It's a very, fraction. very small fraction to and make this work. So that, that should give us hope, right? Just say it yeah. gives us hope. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. Just, oh, just one additional point. I mean, I think everything that, um, that Remy and Sheriff said is, is you know, completely right. I definitely don't have the answers, but I think one thing that does help to explain this is the question of timescales. So when you are the household in question, you take this very long altruistic approach of this is for the next generation, this is for our children. But then it, when it comes to actually accumulating those resources, there's a tendency to resort to sort of short-termism because it's so desperate to see the pennies add onto the pounds or dollars and cents. So, um, and I think that that's the culture by which the financial institutions and the pension funds have operated. You know, it's, it's, it's short-termist. <laughs> and I think one of the things that the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Accord have really helped bring home is the fact that we need to take a much longer-term perspective, not only in our government planning, but in our management of finance, you know, global international finance and public funding and, and private funding. So I think we're seeing a bit of a kind of um, culture shift in the way we think about, you know, investment um, and so on. So I'm, I'm hoping that with policy guidance, a policy framework, you can only go so far with regulation, but you know, with that kind of um, framework in place that shows the, the financial sense of these, of these kind of long-term investments in sustainable development, that we might actually see that change over time. Yeah. So I have another great question. This is Danny Murphy. So I think when we think, unfortunately, when we think about finance for development in the MDGs, we do think a bit about microfinance and mm. giving it to women, et cetera. But I think there's a frustration in this question, and she basically goes, well, why don't we have females actually making decisions about financing? <laughs> so where are we with that? Well, we do have a few. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Christine Lagarde's pretty yeah. influential. I'm gonna throw that but out. Is, is, <laughs> would you say this is generally true across financial houses, or would it matter? I have um, uh, a best friend who is, um, my best friend in the world, is a, is a very senior investment manager in a British um, investment house. And she is uh, constantly called on all the time to go and be the kind of female spokesperson of the British investment you know, world. Um, and she gets really bored of it. She's like, this is just tedious, right? I'm just becoming the token woman who gets passed from event to event. Um, and I think that she's made it a bit of a mission to um, change, again, it comes, I'm sorry to be a boring story, but it's a lot about culture, the way in which these institutions are run, um, the way in which there's a kind of the flexibility of their working arrangements, um, the, the actual in-office culture, and so on. And so I think by addressing some of those really basic, almost HR points in the way a lot of these organizations run, you can really make them much more attractive places for um, you know, professional women, um, which is a little bit speaking to what the Prime Minister was saying earlier about the same goes for politics. Um, well, uh, for us, one of the outcome this October, and it only started because we were uh, we connected two amazing women. Uh, Anushe Ansari is an amazing uh, woman who is a tech entrepreneur. She's the one of the co-founder. Just now, uh, uh, Prince Hakon was showing about the um, the solutions. I think uh, the Singularity University and the Hero X, uh, the X Prize, and then also uh, with Shirley Porges, who was working with Hillary uh, at that time on uh, women entrepreneurship. They are going to create this billion-dollar fund for women uh, in women making decisions on uh, technology, on finance, entrepreneurship. So I think that's one of our announceables for. for outcome and we will have a range of outcomes. We believe there's blended finance solutions and, and the interested parties from uh, different sectors to make it attractive for private sector to invest in these funds that would have returns. So I think that there is uh, a lot of hopes, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's a 
It's a no-brainer. I mean, no I mean yeah. for, for the development community, we all know uh, that the impacts of uh, projects that um, are where women are in charge or are involved are always significantly better. So we have to push for that. We are doing this within the IDFC I was mentioning. Uh, we, have a, we have a working group, a very nice uh, project, for instance, with a, a Turkish bank, which is called uh, TSKB. We, have, we are providing them um, uh, final credit lines. And attached to these credit lines is a condition for the, 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 the corporates that um, have access, uh, well, to have a gender-friendly policy within their own company. And, and it works very well, and this is a model that can be replicable, and so able to scale up uh, uh, gender issues uh, in the private sector, in SMEs. And these are, these, these, these are Turkish colleagues that are leading Good. on that. Good. So I might just do two more. There's two more questions. I'll just do them. They're quite different. But, um, um, so the first one, um, it's really about cities, right? So part of me thinks that even if you get a fund that's orientated towards the SDGs, right? Government, maybe they can blend in terms of finance, but one of the key things they should be doing is that in their procurement contracts, the infrastructural pro pro projects, even at local government, you know, that they can demand. So you have a supply of finance, but the projects have to be there that are demanding, you know, the work on infrastructure, the work in cities has to be SDG orientated. And of course, when you have the demand blended with the work and then the finance that comes in behind it, you basically get this marriage, I think, that you were proposing up there between the business community, the stakeholders on the ground, the finance that's flowing behind it, right? So one person was quite concerned that how do we get finance into local authorities, into cities? So that's one. Um, another one, which is for Jessica, um, the importance of data and tracking results so that we do need to get a sense like give us examples of SDG oriented finance that finds its way into partnerships into blended finance that has an impact on the ground and then through the data to monitor it and actually show the results so in other words what we need is not uh, principles of responsible re investment but we need to demand results in terms of impact of our SDGs on the ground when we actually start pushing money into these types of projects. So there are two, I think, very good questions. Yeah, okay. the data one I think is Great. yours. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the uh, urge to have as much data as possible to try and monitor impact. But I would just caution a little bit away from a, an approach which is entirely results-led. Um, because a great many things that are captured by the SDGs are about building social cohesion, about long-term environmental change, um, about addressing inequalities, um, and so on. And we're not going to see instantaneous impacts of those things. You know, th that's about long -term, uh, a long-term sort of social shift. And so I think for some things, environmental impact to some degree, monitoring you know, flood basins, monitoring groundwater, you know, there's a lot of things that we can see really real-time, high-resolution impact, and that's very compelling. But that shouldn't dissuade us from investing in you know, the social change that's also required to really underpin this and make it sustainable in the long term. Um, so that's my knee-jerk reaction. Thanks. Oh, maybe a word on, um, on cities. Yeah. Um, so it goes back to my point on um, turning, uh, turning non